Hello everyone and good evening and uh, welcome to one of our uh, webinars uh, for coordinated clinical care for weight loss in preparation for orthopedic surgery. I'm Michelle Moore, I'm the medical director of the Bariatric and Metabolic Institute for the West Florida Division that has programs in Tampa, Carrollwood, Ocala, Sebring and Dade City. Uh, with me as a co-speaker uh, and a co-developer of that concept is Dr. Brian Palumbo. He's an orthopedic surgeon in FOI. We've worked together for a long time trying to um, coordinate the care of uh, patients who come in for orthopedic surgeons and who are denied uh, orthopedic surgery because of weight. So the learning objectives for us today are um, to review the effect of uh, obesity on orthopedic uh, outcomes and assess the impact of bariatric surgery on outcomes of orthopedic procedures. That sounds like a you know mouthful, but we want to know how obesity affects uh, the outcomes of orthopedic surgery, and if we put patients through bariatric surgery, will that will these outcomes improve? We also want to talk a little bit about coordinated care between orthopedic uh, surgeons and bariatric surgeons. To start off, uh, let's just define obesity as uh, everyone knows it. The threshold for us to talk about surgical intervention is a BMI of 35. So any person with a BMI of 35 or higher, we would consider them for bariatric surgery. Now, when we think about obesity, it's not only the BMI or the weight, but also the other 56 associated comorbidities. And this is a long list of things, but one of the most important uh, things that we have to deal with with obesity is the increase of um, adverse outcomes from cardiovascular events and poor quality of life. Specifically for orthopedic patients, what um, we want to learn about is 40% um, of patients have diabetes that come to see us or the orthopedic surgeon. Dyslipidemia is present in 50%. About 65% of patients have hypertension on multiple medications. And when we screen patients for sleep apnea, we found that they have it in 70% of the time. In addition, just because we do uh, big operations and the orthopedic surgeons do large interventions, uh, those patients have a lot of malnutrition and more importantly, sarcopenia. And what makes it harder for both the uh, recovery from bariatric surgery and orthopedic procedure is limited uh, mobility. So when patients come to see us, they come in with a, um, a long list of uh, challenges that we have to address and we make sure that uh, we address it before either their orthopedic surgery or their bariatric procedure uh, and address it right in, in collaboration uh, between all teams. Now, the first questions we want to talk about today is how does obesity influence orthopedic surgery outcomes? So I'm going to ask Dr. Palumbo, who's on another uh, site, uh, to uh, get on and uh, talk to us a little bit about that. I have his slides here, so when he's Ready to go on? I'll, uh, uh, let me know, and I'll move the slides forward. Thanks, Dr. Morag. Can Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for uh, you know for inviting me to be part of the CME. I can't tell you how excited I am to be a part of this program. Uh, there's just a tremendous need uh, for you know for arthroplasty patients, and uh, I just again just um, super grateful to be a part of this. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just to touch on kind of the basics of why um, obesity affects hip and knee arthritis and the, uh, the, specifically the knee joint, uh, it's interesting. There's not a, uh, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation of increased uh, body weight to stress on the joint. It's actually a several-fold increase in body weight uh, when we talk about certain activities um, of daily function, specifically things like ascending stairs. It's a three times body weight effect on the on the articular surface, descending stairs, a five times body weight, jogging and squatting up to seven times body weight. So what we're talking potentially over a thousand pounds of force on the articular surface of the knee. And as you might imagine, mechanically, uh, that can be really uh, quite deleterious. And, uh, and, then, and then those forces don't go away after joint replacement. And that really creates uh, some, you know, some problems uh, in the world of uh, revisions. And you can see here on the bottom left, that's a polyethylene component 
uh, which has failed through wear and, uh, frankly, catastrophic deformation. Uh, and then uh, to the right, you'll see this uh, titanium base plate that failed catastrophically in an obese patient, really creating challenges uh, from a surgical perspective and, of course, really diminishes the function uh, for the patient. Next slide. So while um, obviously those mechanical stresses can be uh, very impactful to the joint, it's also been proposed that uh, patients who are obese and specifically patients with metabolic syndrome have increased synovial macrophage activation, which, really, which uh, results in an increased production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and uh, creates a really a biologic milieu for uh, cartilage destruction and progressive arthritis. So now you have uh, these mechanical stresses, which can be rather intense, talking about, uh, you know, a thousand, over a thousand pounds of compressive and shear forces, and then also this biologic component of increased pro-inflammatory cytokines and, and inflammatory mediators that are uh, going to destroy uh, and progress, uh, destroy the joint and cause and progress arthritis. Next slide. Uh, so one might say, Dr. Plummer, that's great news, right? <laughs> that, you know, you're going to have a, a, just a, you know, a dramatic, you know, increase in your business over the next several decades. But the reality, it really does create some challenges for our community, both logistically and financially. This is an interesting study by, by Kurtz uh, in 2007, a very frequently cited study. And correctly, he predicted this uh, nearly exponential increase uh, in demand for total knee replacement to 2030, where he predicts about a three million, a, an incidence of total knee replacements in the, in the range of about three million, and, and then this linear increase in uh, demand for total hip replacements. And then I, I don't think it's coincidental, but we also have this continuing uh, increase, and in, you can kind of uh, advance the slide, uh, this continuing increase in incidence of obesity in the U.S. And again, I, I don't think this is coincidental, and, and this is really why this is a challenge, because with this increase in demand uh, for total joint replacements in younger patients who are bigger, obese, we're going to have an increase in demand for revisions and unfortunately infections. So infections are really expected to increase over the next several decades and they are a substantial financial and logistical burden for our community. Uh, so it really does present a challenge. It's not just increased business for us. Next slide. So from a clinical perspective, you know, I, I, I like to lump my experience with uh, obese patients into two categories, you know, uh, dealing with them in the conservative realm and then also dealing with them, uh, you know, when conservative management fails and we're, and we're discussing how to proceed, with, you know, operatively and with uh, total, joint, uh, total joint arthroplasty. And uh, on the conservative side, uh, it's really important to, to be able to portray the importance of weight loss and how it impacts their function, how it impacts their pain, and, uh, and how it impacts their ability to kind of uh, get back to activities of daily living and recreational activities. And we don't have a lot of studies, frankly, that, uh, that really portray the importance of this. This is actually one of them that I, I found during some uh, recent research. And a really interesting study uh, out of a large uh, database of patients in Australia between 2006 to 2010, what they did was they, uh, they evaluated patients with a BMI of over 25 and without a history of total joint arthroplasty, and they categorized them into four groups, those who lost over 7.5% body weight, 5 to 7.5% uh, body weight loss uh, percentage, and then uh, those with stable weight, and then those who gained more than 5% uh, body weight. And then they associated these patients with admission uh, to hospital for total hip and total knee replacement. And interestingly, what they found, we'll advance the slide, is that an increase of, uh, or I'm sorry, a loss of more than 7.5% body weight uh, reduced the risk of needing a total knee replacement, which to me is really profound. It really helps in that discussion. Uh, interestingly, this did not um, this did not impact the demand or need for a total hip replacement. But uh, further, they uh, they illustrate that for every one percent reduction in weight, there was about a two percent reduction in total knee replacement. Uh, so things like this, and you know, really help in ex when explaining to the patient the importance of weight loss and how it will impact their function. 
and frankly, the potential need or, or, or mitigation of, of need for a total joint replacement. Next slide. Like, and kind of the second you know, realm of discussions that I have with patients is when conservative management fails. And uh, this is where, frankly, I, I probably have this discussion more often. A lot of times patients come from outside surgeons. They were declined a, a joint replacement, and sometimes rightfully so. These patients have BMI of over 40, sometimes over 50 or even higher, and they're not candidates. I think that you know, what I struggle with personally is how it's done. And really is probably the genesis for the program for me uh, and this pathway for me is, is this, this kind of constant or common issue of patients being declined surgery, but really being marginalized and, and sometimes being ridiculed. And, uh, you know, they're sometimes, you know, called fat and what have you. And they say, we're not going to do this operation for you. And really, this is an area where I think our, our uh, community can really improve. I, I find that if I take some time and explain to the patient you know, as you might imagine, this this really does help. Just explain to them why uh, obesity and increased body mass index portends a poor prognosis and it, it will impact their outcome. Once I explain to them, uh, they tend to buy on pretty quickly, and that really is a is a, a means to open up discussion for things like bariatric surgery and weight loss programs. And you know, in graphs such as this, this is a publication in 2017 at a journal of arthroplasty. And frankly, these types of studies are not new. Uh, this is really concrete in our literature with regards to outcomes, survivorship, and infection rates. You know, it's just, it is just well demonstrated. In this study, you can see this uh, kind of direct correlation with increased body mass index and, and lower survivorship in total joint arthroplasty. It's just, again, this is repeated time after time. Next slide. And then in regards to infection, same thing. You know, the, the greater the body mass index, typically when getting over BMI of 40, there is a direct association with, uh, with infection rates. Uh, and then when, you know, once I explain this to patients, they buy in pretty quickly. Once I explain to them that infections are not just, it's not just a small complication where I give you an antibiotic and it goes away. This is a complication where you have at least one, oftentimes at least two or more operations and many times they don't regain the function that they would have had after a primary joint replacement that, that had gone successfully. Uh, once I explain to them, it really opens the door for avenues like bariatric surgery. And again, is really the genesis uh, for this pathway. And I can, again, I would just, you know, just say that the pathways like this, it, it, there's just a tremendous need for it. And to that, uh, to that point, I'll pass it back to Dr. Murrow. Well, thank you, Brian. This is very uh, clear and it uh, cements our uh, thinking that uh, truly obesity is uh, a um, detrimental disease as far as uh, you know, personal health and quality of life. So we've known all along now for uh, many years since been doing bariatric surgery that uh, weight loss improves uh, comorbidities and improves quality of life, increases survival. And we studied very specific areas such as sleep apnea and liver pathology. And we wanted to make sure when we go out and talk to our colleagues, we would be able to tell them uh, whether bariatric surgery would improve the outcomes of orthopedic surgery. So if somebody had bariatric surgery prior to having their knee fixed, would that make things easier on the patient and of course on the surgeon? So uh, we, I did a summary and a literature review uh, in the um, last year, we published in 2020, and we looked at specific uh, publications in the English literature that deal with obesity and bariatric surgery and orthopedic outcomes. This was a major uh, work that I had with a couple of colleagues, including Medtronic, and I had Tom Bernasek talk to me about it for a while. Uh, we screened 90 publications, uh, 28 publications of those met the criteria that had meaningful data. Six of them did not have any meaningful data as far as bariatric surgery. Nine of them were literature reviews, so we didn't want to uh, re-review a literature review. And we picked up 13 publications that we analyzed and I'm going to share with you the data. When we examined the outcomes, we wanted to learn more about surgical outcomes, which are very important, such as uh, you know prosthesis infection, surgical site infection, dislocation or interventions for those, but also from a system point of view, patients who have medical complications such as pulmonary embolus, deep venous thrombosis, respiratory failure, 
uh, MIs, acute kidney injury, or cerebrovascular accidents. Those are also so much correlated with uh, obesity. And we dissected all that data and collated it. And at the end of the day, there were nine studies that showed that uh, bariatric surgery prior to orthopedic surgery decreased major and minor complications of the orthopedic procedure. It reduced operative time and decreased the length of stay and lowered the risk of reoperations for uh, joint problems and readmissions. And at the same time, there were two studies that did not show any benefit, but also showed that bariatric surgery prior to orthopedic surgery meant uh, there's a risk for increased reoperation for stiffness and revisions and an increased likelihood of wound infection. As with all the literature, there's you know pros and cons and two meta-analyses that were done that use the same data that we've worked on uh, showed, uh, one of them showed benefits uh, for uh, bariatric prior to orthopedic surgery and one did not show any benefits. So we were uh, looking at these um, data and uh, we had more uh, questions than answers at the end of the day, but we knew that uh, bariatric surgery helps and more importantly, the reason why these data did not come out very clean is many of the studies has uh, heterogeneous patients. There were different bariatric procedures done over multiple periods of time. And uh, sometimes patients had bariatric surgery 10, 20 years before their orthopedic procedure. And some of the patients did not lose weight. So they bounced back into the obese category. And many of those data are not randomized. So. We're patiently awaiting a, a study by the Geisinger Clinic to uh, solidify these conclusions that bariatric surgery improves the outcomes of orthopedic uh, patients in orthopedic surgery. Now, having said all of that, I want to take you back to uh, talk a little bit about bariatric surgery because that's something we want to make uh, all our colleagues aware as well as uh, patients. I want to talk about a, a, a brief overview. I want to talk to you a little bit about procedures and what to expect and how to prepare your patients to go see a bariatric surgeon or a medical weight loss person, as well as how to bring them in back to your office to uh, work on their joints or their spine. Now, this is one of the most important slides that we have, and it has two take-home messages. This is the Swedish obesity study. And in Sweden, they have a closed health system. They uh, have everybody report and they track data for a long time. And they are um, in Sweden. They randomized about 1,500 patients to medical versus surgical uh, operations. Now, one of the most important pieces of this, if somebody who entered the study and their BMI was 40 and went into medical treatment, some of the weight came off. But at the 10-year mark, the weight was the same, maybe a little less or a little higher. So. Uh, lesson number one from this slide is the natural history of obesity is obesity. So weight would not come off by itself. You have to really uh, do an intervention. The second most important piece of this operation, these were three different operations with different outcomes, but the most important piece is whatever surgical treatment these patients had, at the end of 10 years, their weights were significantly less than the medical treatment. So now we know for sure it's randomized medical versus and surgical treatment that bariatric surgery reduces weight uh, over the long term. Now, on individual uh, patients, uh, we would tell them that once you go through surgery, the weight loss would drop dramatically in the first year to second year. The weight loss would nadir at the second, uh, between uh, the first and second years. And there is a little bit of incremental weight gain over the years as far as, you know, uh, adding a little bit of muscle mass, but also adding fat weight with years. But at the end of the day, the weight loss is about 50% of the excess weight that people came in. This is significant, not only because of the weight loss itself, because of the amelioration of comorbidities. On this graph, I tracked 600 patients, and in blue is their uh, comorbidities before surgery, and in yellow, their comorbidities after. So obstructive sleep apnea almost universally improved, so we didn't even register on the graph. Hypertension in about 85% of patients, there's complete resolution with no medication. Similarly with medications for uh, joint pain, uh, and I called it arthropathy, but it's truly joint pain that we track. GERD is the same way, dramatic drop. And more importantly, look at diabetes. We really have a very good intervention for diabetes by reducing the uh, fat uh, and insulin resistance 
Uh, about 85% of patients get off their medications in the first week, about 95 in six weeks. So there's a huge, tremendous impact on cardiovascular comorbidities such as diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, and hypertension. So we know now when we do bariatric surgery, we take patients uh, from a cardiovascular point of view from a high risk to a low risk based on these data. Well, I want to briefly talk to you a little bit about uh, bariatric procedures. And this is an illustration of the gastric band. It used to be very common. We don't do it anymore. I just wanted to show it so you are familiar uh, with it. It's a band that's a silicon and it's placed around uh, the proximal portion of the stomach and it's connected to a reservoir that goes underneath the skin into something like a mediport. So we inject saline in the system and it constricts uh, the intake of food and for the most part of it, the weight loss is modest. We don't do it any uh, longer because patients were dissatisfied with it and now it's one of the common operations is to remove the band and convert them to another procedure. The other common procedure is called the uh, sleeve gastrectomy or the gastric sleeve and it entails dividing the stomach uh, along this line thereby creating a um, tubularized stomach like the shape and size of a banana. This portion of the stomach which is the storage uh, portion of the stomach is removed and discarded. And patients lose weight based on restriction of oral intake. The gastric bypass is really the gold standard and it's been there for many, many years. The stomach is divided and partitioned in a very small pouch. And the remainder stomach remains in place and it's excluded. And we borrow the small intestine and bring it up and therefore passage of food for patients would be from the esophagus into the pouch, into the proximal jejunum, and then this is where digestion and absorption occurs. Now, I put these up there for a reason. They're similar but not uh, equal. All operations are good and effective, but they're not equal at all. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, with banding, I plotted complications and uh, mortality, as well as I plotted on the y-axis uh, weight loss and resolution of diabetes. So with bands, which is a low risk procedure, the amount of weight loss can be very variable. And most people get in this range in the first two years and drop to this range in the, after that. So we um, no longer do the band. The sleeve, which is uh, the operation that divides the stomach and partitions it, is a little higher risk than the band and a little higher uh, uh, impact as far as weight loss, but there's quite a variability on this, and that's important in choosing who gets the sleeve or the bypass, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. The sleeve is very dependent on food management and physical activity in the first year after surgery. The bypass, which we talked about a little earlier, has a higher risk of uh, complications, but also has a higher amount of weight loss. And notice that the variability of weight loss gets very tight with this because it works in two mechanisms. One is uh, portion control and you know uh, restriction of food, but also in uh, di in male digestion of nutrients in the proximal jejunum, and therefore ameliorating the insulin resistance and keeping the metabolic rate high. And therefore, patients lose weight regardless. Uh, what happens in the first year. The duodenal switch is an operation that is truly malabsorptive. It's based on fat malabsorption. It has a higher likelihood of complication, a higher weight, and a very small variability in weight loss. Uh, we would not do these operations anymore because of the high um, likelihood of protein calorie malnutrition. We're revising many of those and therefore it's not our primary or secondary or any other operation. We would strongly tell people that if you were to come to bariatric surgery, you have to think about the sleeve and the gastric bypass. Now I want to put a case study for uh, all of us to talk about. This is a real patient. Uh, she was uh, 39 years old. Uh, she came to see me at uh, um, about uh, 13 months ago, and she told me that her orthopedic surgeon told her she, he cannot do uh, the surgery because of her weight and told her to lose weight. Her BMI was 51, so that's quite a bit of BMI for a short person. She was quite visceral, you know, upper body. Her uh, 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 her legs were small, her knees were not big. She had prediabetes, she had severe obstructive apnea, uh, and she had hyperlipidemia on medication, severe reflux. Her ASA, based on our quick calculation in the office, was three. She could not do any physical activity at all and she could not exercise because she had two 
uh, knee um, uh, work done on her knees before. And uh, her surgeon told her there's nothing else we could do. You got to lose the weight before we fix your knees. Uh, so the patient came and saw us and we put her through our program. Uh, in the first a uh, few months we put her through dietary visits. Every one of the patients would meet a dietitian to talk a little bit about portion control, but also to talk about protein intake, but also to talk about you know, support with vitamins and supplements after surgery. And this is a process that takes a couple of months to three months to get patients in and to understand the changes that they do after uh, surgery. In the next uh, few weeks in September or October, we had a pulmonary consult. We put her on a CPAP after a sleep study was done, and we did this through uh, our people in the office. And because she had severe reflux and we were worried about having a Barrett's, we asked for a GI clearance and we did her endoscopy in preparation. Uh, although she's young, but her risk factors were high, so we asked for a cardiac clearance. And uh, one of my partners did the endoscopy after all of this work is done in preparation for surgery. We wanted to know if there were any ulcers or gastritis in the stomach before proceeding so we can plan our procedures better. Now, uh, we uh, put her on uh, a low molecular weight heparin for two weeks after surgery because of her limited mobility and we did a gastric bypass. And this green line that I didn't talk about uh, is there. We put her a little bit through um, protein diet, uh, protein shake, uh, diet for two weeks before surgery to drop her weight, uh, you know, 10, 15 pounds just to uh, improve her cardiometabolic uh, fitness. And in the next year, her weight dropped down from 280 uh, to about uh, 180. Uh, we finished uh, all of this. She had uh, gone back to her orthopedic surgeon at the six months uh, mark after she lost about 100 pounds and had a, a total knee arthroplasty. I had uh, uh, physical therapy and we monitor her uh, metabolic criteria in metabolic uh, labs such as CBC, CMP, A1C, ferritin, folate, B12, and vitamin D. So this uh, illustrates uh, what we would do as a group, what are the thresholds to send patients back to the orthopedic surgeon, and how we keep communication uh, open. Now, when we talked to Brian and his group, we talked about specifically what are the things that we uh, should look for uh, to get patients back to the orthopedic surgeon uh, as soon as possible, and that's as, as soon as the weight loss nadirs. So that can happen in some people like the previous patient in six to nine months. Uh, many patients may uh, take about a year to uh, have the lowest weight and build up uh, enough muscle mass in the meantime. Uh, we, uh, we, th we, we think also that if uh, weight loss is still uh, slowing down a little bit, we can uh, send them up to see the orthopedic surgeon as early as nine months and start the process of assessing whether they need additional work uh, and on their knees or not. Now, the things that we want to make sure we check before we send them back uh, to the orthopedic providers are make sure the, their um, CBC is uh, on par, their protein levels are okay pre-albumin to check nutrition, lymphocyte and uh, iron studies as well as uh, vitamins. And on the, in the big picture, we make sure their uh, A1C is less than seven. So this person would come to your office and you would say, well, we're going to have to fix their uh, ankle. And they already had a knee operation and uh, this person's BMI is 45 and he's a man and it's all in the upper body. And you'd say, is this person is a candidate? And um, right away, I would say, uh, if uh, you see somebody with a BMI greater than 35 with any comorbidities, we would consider them a candidate for intervention and surgical treatment. Uh, we would make sure that we have worked with them on medical interventions before, as well as patients would understand what they're looking into and what the procedure entails and the risks are. Now, as far as orthopedic surgeons, uh, when you see somebody who had bariatric surgery before, uh, then you should uh, check and make sure they had adequate weight loss. Not all patients who had bariatric lose weight. Not all patients who lose weight keep it off uh, over the long term. So we must insist on good weight loss. Uh, and anemia and hypocalcemia or uh, osteopenia is very common in patients who had uh, surgery. So uh, ask for them to be checked and addressed before, uh, as well as we um, many patients 
uh, don't have sleep apnea after they lose weight, but some who regain weight regain the sleep apnea, and you should be able to see if they have it or not by talking to uh, your uh, medical colleagues. Uh, we, ins we, we help each other by uh, emphasizing to patients that they should have alternative to NSAIDs because of the high likelihood of GI bleeding and ulcers after bariatric surgery. And as far as we're concerned, if you have any questions, just call us and say, what do we need to do uh, to get patients ready for surgery? This is my last slide. I'm going to stop here to take questions. In the meantime, when we're um, preparing questions, I wanted to ask Dr. Palombo, now how do patients um, respond to you when you talk to them about weight and, hey, I, wanna, I want you to think about bariatric surgery? Yeah, I, I um, well, I found it's it's changed over time. Uh, candidly, I think uh, our interactions and our meetings and me learning more about you know the bariatric surgery and the pathway that you've established really has helped kind of my dialogue with the patients. I, I have found that it, it really does take a little time, and you know, you know, I I really do take try to take at least five ten minutes to try to gain the patient's trust. Um, if uh, if I if I'm if I don't have time and I just bring it up in in passing and you know I say that you're overweight and you know I don't spend enough you know time educating the patient then my experience is that they take it you know pretty negatively so um, usually I try to gain their trust and uh, and then and then just explain to them once I think I have found if they if they know the reasoning why it's important if I explain to them. You know whether it's conservative management, how it impacts their pain, how it impacts their function, or for for dealing with arthroplasty, and how uh, you know obesity uh, impacts um, infection rates and and uh, survivorship. Um, typically, once they understand that it's really in their best interest to move, you know, to move into some type of pathway, whether it's medical, uh, medical weight loss or bariatric surgery, they typically respond pretty well. Uh, and again, in, in contrary, you know, there my experience is that with if you know with with other or, or competing practitioners, if they you know if they just say that you have to lose weight, uh, don't you know don't come back unless you lose 50 pounds. Uh, the experience is that you know, they they typically respond pretty negatively. So I don't know if that hopefully that answers your question. Yes, that's uh, that's very good. You know, we learned that language too, and um, it is so critical to. Uh, Put ourselves in the shoes of our patients. Yeah, I think it's I, you know it's one of those things, and I think in my, our community it's it's like we and listen it's 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 definitely harder work to do joint replacements on these folks, but um, you know it's easy it's easy to forget that these are human beings and you know they they have weaknesses just like just like we all do, and uh, I think we we it's it's really up to us it's our uh, responsibility to have a strategy to help kind of help them navigate the system. That's great. Well, this has been an exciting uh, topic for us, right? And uh, we wanted to uh, look at it from uh, the point of view of science and we could show these outcomes. It's going to take us a few years to really cement the conclusion uh, that really if you have uh, obesity and you need an orthopedic procedure, you must uh, go to bariatric surgery. But I think you talked about some of the evidence if you lose 5 to 7 percent of uh, weight, your operative risk for uh, ortho procedures goes down. Uh, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I have to say that I've had an anecdotal experience. I, you know, I, um, I have moderate, you know, moderate grade arthritis in my right knee. I lost about 15 pounds and it doesn't bug me. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, some, when we look at that table, we're talking about a several fold change in um in stress on the joint when you lose you know but you know when you lose weight uh, it does make sense uh, i think if you know if we're talking in in the short term over a period of maybe months or a few years uh, i think it probably is you know has relevance of course when we're dealing with bmis in the range of you know over 40 50 60 i i don't i, I don't think it's as relevant and candidly that's kind of uh you know really segued into my own you know, clinical practice guidelines. You know, I, I think prior to us working together, I was much more apt to at least try uh, medical weight loss programs for patients who had a BMI of 50, 50, maybe even even 60. Uh, now, once I see those really high BMIs, I, I typically refer them directly to you or I really 
encourage them to, you know, to consider that path. Uh, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes they're, they, they still object. I've, I've been surprised how frequently they, they are open to it. It's, uh, that, that's definitely been a, a pleasant surprise uh, during this process of working together. The patients really do, really are open uh, to uh, the, the bariatric pathway. But as far as you know, losing seven and a half pounds, I think it's definitely relevant in the short term and uh, definitely helps you know, with them to, uh, to manage their pain. As to whether it's going to you know, prevent a joint replacement in their lifetime, I, I don't know if that's really that um, that relevant. Yeah, th those are very important concepts we just touched on. Uh, so, um, when I, when we think about body weight and the impact of obesity, I think about it in two ways. One, metabolic, like visceral obesity, a few pounds really make a big difference. Uh, to lower the A1C and the blood pressure, but a total body weight on joint is is a different story, right? So um, we surveyed a lot of patients early on. This was as far as 20 years ago. When they came to see us, we learned a few things from them. Number one, almost all of them have dieted at least 12 times in their lifetime. Those are adults, right? And almost all of them have lost weight on medical weight, you know, interventions and gained it back and almost all of them don't want to be ever back on diets. So there was a certain uh, way they told us, look, when, when we come and see you, don't ask me to lose weight. Just move me through the operation, show me what I need to do, and uh, keep going. But of course, those were self-selected. They wanted to have surgery. Uh, but we see patients who come in to, uh, to you or to us and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm on the fence about this. What do I need to do? And I think some of the information about how to clean up the diet, uh, do a little bit more activity, uh, and take off some weight uh, is very helpful. Well, I think uh, we we covered almost all of what we need to cover, and uh, we ask all the questions. Uh, are there any other thoughts uh, from uh, listeners? And Brian, do you have any other thing you want to share? No, this is, again, this is just an exciting program. I know in, in my community, this is really, um, you know, bar none, there's just not nothing that I'm aware of that really is, um, you know, serving this function. So I'm super excited to be a part of it. And I, I, I'm excited to see how it progresses over the next several years. Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight and uh, I look forward to further collaboration. Thank you all and good night. Thank you. Good night. Mm -hmm. Thank you.